like you to imagine with me for a minute that you're on duty today at the local fire hall. You're a firefighter in your beloved community. Not only are you a firefighter, you're actually the fire captain. You're in charge of that hall today. Now, you've had a pretty easy day so far. You've done your morning workout, you've checked your trucks, and you found out that your new recruit has amazing culinary talents and he's cooked you a delicious meal. And so you're sitting there digesting this delicious meal, laughing, joking, talking about what you're going to do tonight at short change. Sounds delightful, doesn't it? <laughs> Suddenly the alarm bell goes off. 69 Delta. It's a structure fire. And it's not just any structure fire. Reports are streaming in that a large apartment, apartment complex is fully involved in flame. And not only that, but you're hearing reports that there are people trapped, there are people hanging from balconies. It's pandemonium and chaos. Now, as you get into your truck and start rolling out of the hall, it suddenly dawns on you that you're going to be the first arriving unit. That means you are going to be in charge of this call. You're going to be in charge of how that unfolds. Quick, what do you do when confronted with this scene? Lives are at stake, seconds matter. What's your decision? What do you do right now? Do you feel your heart rate elevate a little bit? Do you feel a little bit of anxiety? This is the type of situation that fire ground commanders are expected to face regularly. And a few years ago when I was doing my graduate studies, I wanted to learn why it is that some incident commanders can show up to a scene like this and they seem to be able to just kick butt. Their team falls into place and they put that fire out very quickly. And then other incident commanders who have the same level of experience, expertise, and knowledge seem to fall a little bit short of that standard. Their teams seem to be plagued with problems. Things don't go quite as well as they had hoped. And so today I want to talk to you a little bit about the lessons I learned and how I was able to apply some of those lessons to my own life. And I'm hoping to convince you that no matter what overwhelming fire confronts you in your own personal life, that you're more than capable of handling it. And I'm hoping to leave you with a few tips about how you can pioneer being a change agent for positivity and sustainability, not only in your own life, but in your family life, your organizational life, and in society, by looking through the lens of the emerging science of self-organizing systems. Now, the first lesson I learned was that control is an illusion. The universe from the bottom to the top is self-organizing. And this is true of all systems, whether we're talking about molecules, whether we're talking about cells, whether we're talking about a baby growing in the mother's womb. And it's not just true of, of, of biological systems. It's also true of our human organizations, our businesses, our nation states. And the theory of self-organizing systems offers us a robust explanation as to why it is we can change the leader of a nation state, and yet that nation state seems to plot on on the same course. The policies don't change appreciably. So, the bad news is, nobody's in control. But the good news is, anybody, any individual in a system can be a catalyst for amazing change. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the types of change agents we see. Now, the first type of change agent we see is the archon. Archon is a Greek word. It means ruler. And on the fire ground, uh, the archon shows up as a guy who believes that order emerges from the top down. And therefore, the firefighters become extensions of his will. And leadership to him looks like overcoming resistance. And the fire firefighters are pawns for him to move around the fire ground. Now, it's not hard to see why this type of mental model emerges in the fire service, because we have this traditional command and control language. We issue orders, not suggestions. The problem is this mental model doesn't line up very well with reality. And so we see all sorts of negative unintended consequences occur, despite their best intentions. Uh, we see firefighters freelancing out of organization with each other. The fires seem to take longer to put out. Oh, the liberator, on the other hand, is a guy who intuitively knows that the firefighters are doing the actual work. They're putting the wet stuff on the red stuff. And so his job is to support them and provide value to them. To him, leadership is about attraction. And he focuses on the one thing that he can control most, and that's himself and how he shows up for his team. 
And as a result, we see positive unintended consequences occur. Instead of one brain tackling that complex problem, we now have 20 or 30 brains working together to tackle that problem. And we see novelty emerge, we see creativity emerge, and we see innovative practices emerge that then go on to other fire crews and other fire departments. So we're really talking about two forces here. We're talking about the force of entropy, the, the tendency of a system to devolve into chaos and disorder. And in fact, firefighters can be thought of as entropy fighters. Our job is to stop entropy from happening, to limit the damage. But we want to be more than that in our own lives, in our own organizations. We actually want to breathe life into our organizations. We want to make them alive, resilient, robust, able to adapt to a changing environment, able to handle complexity, able to reproduce. So archons tend to lead towards more entropy, and liberators tend to lead towards more life. Now, in my, my life outside of uh, the fire department, I've been a liberty activist for the better part of a decade. I've raged against the machine. I've produced videos. I've uh, even written some blogs that have gotten me into trouble. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I've ended up uh, somehow as leader of a federal political party. And, and so there's one thing I knew when I started my graduate studies, and that was that I was a liberator. Wrong. <laughs> I was not a liberator. This is me at 3 in the morning explaining to someone why they're wrong on the internet. <laughs> my, my conception of advancing liberty was bashing people over the head with reason and evidence, trying to overcome their resistance. I, I was embodying the very thing that I was fighting against. You know, I was like a 400-pound man trying to sell people on my amazing new diet. And uh, it just didn't work. You see, leadership is, is fractal. Leaders emit a fractal, and around them, people adapt to that fractal. And this is why awesome fire, fire ground commanders have awesome crews. You need to look in the change. And as Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Now, the most painful lesson to me when I looked in the mirror was that I was not a good father. I was falling short. As much as I shouted at the world, don't tread on me, I was treading on my kids. I was a hypocrite. Effective fire ground commanders don't use threats of punishments or promises of reward to get people motivated. In fact, people follow them wholeheartedly into burning buildings. Removing carrots and sticks from my, my parenting toolbox was a real challenge. But at the end of the day, I didn't want my kids to be avoiding punishment or, or seeking bribes. I wanted them to do good for goodness sakes. I wanted them to be able to chart their own destiny, create their own reality. And so the best thing I ever did was make a commitment to removing carrots and sticks from my parenting toolbox. And it required a change of mind because as Jeff Goldstein says, clients aren't resisting change so much as they're attracted to a core of self-esteem, dignity, and a sense of personal power. And the question I had always been asking was, how do I overcome my kids' resistance? I'm smarter than them. They should get this and listen to me. And instead, I started asking, how can I, how can I empower them? How can I appeal to their sense of personal power? And when I figured that out, uh, some amazing things started to happen in my family. And I'm so happy that I adopted that uh, mindset. But fear gets in the way, fear of losing control of the fire ground creates treading on people. Fear of our kids not being safe, not being healthy, not having a good future gets in the way of us not treading on our children. Effective fire ground commanders, when they arrive to an emergency scene and chaos and pandemonium rays, rain, they, they step out of that truck and they are grounded, they're centered, they're calm, and they're assertive. And they command authority. The scene starts to calm down just by their very presence. Order starts to emerge. They choose their mindset. One of the other things they do and they know is that a positive crew is a, a, a happy warrior is a more effective warrior than a sad, frustrated, angry one. And so they create a positive environment on shift. And research backs this up very clearly. 
we know that fear, anxiety, frustration, anger, these are negative emotions that literally cloud our mind. They impair our judgment. They create cognitive dysfunction. The most optimal mindset is one that's described as having your cognition poised on the edge of chaos, where novelty, innovation, and creativity emerge. And so there's these two competing forces in our brain. There's the archon and the liberator. And if you've ever been cut off in traffic by an idiot uh, and had your day ruined, you, you know what it's like to be made the slave of the archon, because it wasn't that idiot that ruined your day. It was the archon in your brain that made, it ruined your day. And the reality is we can choose our mindset. And, there, and there's a couple really valuable tools I learned during my research that, that I've employed that have been helpful to me. One of them is the attitude of gratitude. I wake up first thing in the morning, and instead of looking at all the negative things people have said about the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada, I go to my water cooler, and I take a tall, cool glass of water, and I think about all the things I'm grateful for. And that primes me for my day. And the other thing I've found that's very helpful is something that fire ground commanders do intuitively, and that's take deep, slow, rhythmic breaths. And deep, slow, rhythmic breathing has been shown to improve your heart rate variability. Your heart rate variability is an objective sign that cortisol levels, so adrenaline levels are coming down, and that your mind is open. So you can choose your mindset. No one else is responsible for your mindset but yourself, and that's a very powerful message. The final lesson that I learned that was uh, very difficult for me was that I, I'm going to die. And there's three things that tend to happen to firefighters uh, that cause us to detach from life. The first thing is that, that we're exposed to death on a regular basis. We just become numb to it. You know, we could go to a traffic accident where there's brain splattered on the highway and then go afterwards and eat a Big Mac and think nothing of it. And the second thing that happens is that we're reminded regularly that the best thing we can do is die for the greater good. The third thing that happens to us is that we're told by people around us, people in our community and our loved ones, that we're heroes. And so when we're feeling weak, when we're feeling vulnerable, when we're feeling afraid, we tend to isolate ourselves. We don't want people to be disappointed to know that we're just human. So we tend to become undead. We become like zombies just waiting to die. Now, a few years ago, I had an experience that broke me out of my complacency and my detachment from life. I was responding to a house fire, a basement fire, and I was leading a crew of two other guys into this basement fire in a, a call similar to what you see here. Now, if you've ever seen Chicago fire or backdraft, you know exactly what a fire is not like. In real life, <laughs> As in this case, we were operating completely blind. Thick black smoke so we couldn't see our hands in front of our face. To make matters worse, in this house it belonged to a hoarder. And that means there were piles of clothes, garbage bags full of, of debris, sporting equipment, you name it. There was not a, a space to step on. So we were wading through this basement, completely blind, stumbling, trying to drag our hose through and find the seat of the fire. And as we're going through this fire, immediately this, the, the, all of a sudden the heat started to rise dramatically. And at the same time, we heard our incident commander order us to evacuate. Something was getting out of hand. Now the way you exit a building quickly in that situation is you follow your hose line back out. That's your lifeline. And so we're trained, if, you hold it, if you're holding it with your left hand, you grab it with your right hand and you, that should take you out the door to safety. So I made sure my two crew members were on their way back out the door, and when I reached around to grab the hose, I fell backwards into the chaotic mess that was the floor. Within seconds, I was completely disoriented, frantically trying to find the hose line to no avail, and I was alone in the dark and feeling the heat come down on me. Now, in that moment, I knew for a fact that I was going to die. There was just no way I was getting out of that alive. And of course, my thoughts immediately went to my kids, immediately went to all the things that I had left undone in life, all the things I'd left unsaid on the table, my hopes, my dreams. And fear overtook me. Somehow I managed to refocus and take some deep breaths and get out of that fire, but I emerged from that fire a changed man. I was no longer waiting to die. I was feeling fully alive. 
heroism to me no longer meant sacrificing myself for the greater good. It meant being the best version of myself for the greater good, fully alive. Liberty for me no longer meant this utopian vision that's over the horizon that requires everyone else to get on board to achieve. It was something to be savored right here in this moment, right now, and it was to be nurtured and it was to be shared with others. My hope for you is that you remember that you're going to die so that you can remember to live. What would it mean to you if you were fully alive? What if you knew for a fact that you were powerful beyond measure, that you had the ability to unleash unimaginable change in your own life and in the world around you? It's a scary thought, isn't it? Because then maybe you have a duty to act. Maybe you have an obligation to become that. We know that the world is self-organizing, and that means that change can start anywhere, and it can go everywhere. So the question is, how will you show up? Will you punch the clock waiting to die? Will you let fear overtake you and become an archon, an agent of chaos? Or will you unleash the inner hero and lead with liberty?